If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to open them to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38, if you will indulge me, um, I would like to address a theme uh, that is from a new book that I have that just came out a few weeks ago called Not God Enough. Um, I will tell you that I always feel sheepish whenever I do some kind of um, something that connects to a book I've written because I've always thought that using a preaching platform to promote a book is a really, really, really tacky thing to do. Uh, And I'm pretty sure somewhere in the Bible it says that whenever you self-promote, an angel loses his wings and a puppy dies in heaven. Uh, So I I hesitate to do this. Um, I will tell you that Veronica and I have dedicated all the proceeds that come from this book to feed hungry children. Uh, Their names are Karis, Allie, Raya, and Adden. Uh, They live in my house. So you can feel good about it if, if, if you had a problem. But anyway, it's, let's just say it's what is really on my heart right now. Um, it's what I've been taking our own church through um, recently. So it's pretty fresh on my mind. And I thought um, if you would indulge me, I'd love to be able to share um, just some of the, you know, I guess one of the biggest ideas from it. Uh, the book is called Not God Enough, Why Your Small God Leads to Big Problems. And the basic idea is that almost all of our spiritual problems ultimately go back to a view of God that is too small. And what I mean by spiritual problems, I mean problems like doubt, apathy, unhappiness, insecurity, even jealousy. Um, The irony is, is that as Americans, um, and you and I, uh, we are believers, but we are also out of the culture of the United States. And so this is true of us too. As Americans, we prefer a God who is small. We like to think of God as basically a slightly bigger, slightly smarter version of us because that kind of God feels safe to us. He doesn't embarrass us. He doesn't confuse us. He doesn't contradict us or make us mad. We can explain him and we're able to, you know, account for um, the mysteries that we see that are, are related to him. But this is simply not the God that we encounter in the Bible. The God of the Bible is the opposite of small and manageable. He is big. He's not just big, he is bigger than big. He is bigger than all the words we use to say big. He is bigger than our attempts to describe or categorize him. And here is the irony. It is only a God like that that is capable of sustaining our faith It is only a God of that kind of size that is capable of encompassing the mysteries of our existence or igniting our passions for him. Solomon calls this recognition of the size of God, the fear of God, and says that the fear of God is the beginning of faith. The fear of the Lord, he says, is the beginning of knowledge. And what that verse means is that without a trembling awe before the majesty of God, we're never going to be able to have any real knowledge of God, regardless of how many doctrines that we know. You see, this is the step that for many years I tried to skip in my faith, even in seminary. Now, this is not a a really popular confession to make as a pastor, but throughout my life, throughout my life, I have struggled with belief because there were a lot of hard questions that I just didn't really feel like I had great answers for. I knew the seminary answer, and I'm not dissing on that. I knew how to give you know, the Wayne Grudem answer to that particular question, um, but I, I just didn't feel in my heart like I really, I didn't feel like it was a great answer. Questions like, why is there so much suffering in the world? I, I, I mean, I understand that God can use a lot of the thing, bad things that happen for his good purposes. I get that, but what possible good could God have been bringing through the Holocaust? Or how does the concept of hell align with a view of a loving God? I mean, again, I know how to explain it, but how does it really, I mean, if I were God, would I have created a hell that my enemies would suffer in forever and ever and ever? Or how about this one? If, if Christianity is true, why do so few people, relatively speaking, why do so few people in the world believe it? And why isn't God doing more about it to get people saved? I mean, he's God, right? He can do whatever he wants. Why not just send out an angel to preach the gospel? You say, well, that's against the rules. Whose rules? Why couldn't God do that? Why couldn't God do a whole bunch of Apostle Paul kind of things where he just knocks people off their horses or out of their cars and reveals himself to them? I mean, if God can do whatever he wants, why didn't he get more involved? A couple summers ago, my family and I worked for a week with a group of Syrian refugees over in Turkey, and my eight-year-old daughter asked me um, after one of the days that we'd spent all day with this group of you know, refugees, she said, Dad, if God loves these people so much, why didn't he fix all of this? So I, you know, I said, I said to her, I was like, well, he is sweetheart. You know, he's just using us to do it. Standard pastor answer, right? I mean, that's pastor 101. Not satisfied. My eight-year-old daughter pressed back. She's like, but dad, why doesn't God do something about it himself? I mean, it's a fair question. Why not send that army of angels that we've heard so much about? And why not just make the war in Syria go away? You see, my guess is that maybe you've had some of these same questions, maybe others. 
Maybe you've wondered why God, maybe it's as simple as why God hadn't let your particular ministry take off and you see a friend next to you that is half as smart and half as worthy as you are, but theirs has taken off and you're kind of still, you know, putzing around just trying to get B's and C's in seminary and taking care of eight kids at a rural church. You know, may, even after coming to a place where I, I, I believed, where I was solid in my belief, you know, and, and by the way, that happened because I became convinced that there really was no other explanation for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ than the fact that, you know, he really was who he says he was. Even after that, though, with these questions, I still had trouble f- loving God and feeling close to him. Now, how do you feel close to a being that so bewilders you and confuses you? I mean, y'all, I wanted to love God. I mean, I knew how to stand up and be like, oh, is the deer pants for the waters of my soul longs after you. And I knew people in our church who le- seemed like they loved God. There's a lady in our church that every single time she prays for me, she's on our prayer table, every single time that she prays for me, she or talks about God's grace, she tears up. And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, well, I don't know why I don't tear up when I talk about God's grace. Sometimes it just feels so cold and clinical. And I knew how to act the part. I knew how to, you know, kind of squint my eyes and, and, and make that I'm spiritual too face when, you know, people were saying things, how to grunt, you know, like the seminary people learned to grunt. I knew all those things. Um, I knew how to act the part, but a lot of times, I'm just telling you, the emotions weren't there. You see, I've come to see that one of my primary problems in all of this, and all of it was a conception of God that was too small. It was actually comforting to me that as I read the Bible, I was relieved to see that lots of people in the Bible seem to have the exact same struggle that I did. You know, it's amazing when you just take a step back and consider, and I promise you I'm getting to the book of Job here in a second, but it's amazing when you step back and consider how many of the greatest saints in the Bible doubted and doubted severely. I mean, like Job that we're going to look at here briefly today. I mean, (laughs) you know, Job, God calls him the righteous, most righteous person on earth at the time. And he's basically got a book where for 38 chapters, he yells at God and says, I don't understand. Or how about King David, the man after God's own heart, who repeatedly complains in the Psalms. You know, you read some of these Psalms and you get to the end of them, like Psalm 89, where David says, God, where are you? You've abandoned me. Darkness is my only friend. I've got nobody else. You're totally absent and silent. I'm confused. The end. I I can't remember the last time we sang that Psalm in our church, at least. I mean, it's just... David, John the Baptist, whom Jesus called the greatest preacher ever to live. John the Baptist goes through a time after he baptizes Jesus where he sends Jesus a messenger and says, are you actually the Messiah? Because we're, I'm kind of rethinking now because all this stuff that you're not doing that I thought you were going to do. Maybe my favorite scene in the entire New Testament, Matthew 28, 17, you, you might know this. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He spent 40 days with his disciples discussing theology and telling them about the great commission and eating and drinking with them and visit 40 days then he gets them on the mountain acts 28 16 says he begins to ascend right matthew 28 17 as he's ascending back up to heaven some worshiped but others doubted i'm like guys he's floating in the air i mean literally like he's in the air and they're like i don't know i'm not sure i I saw the david blaine special i'm just not i'm not sure that that means what it, how would they doubt in a moment like that well i mean the answer is because what jesus had not done was still so confusing to them that it made them still question in their heart is he actually the messiah how could the messiah leave the earth in the condition that he's leaving it in right how could he leave when there's literally 12 of us that don't have jobs or any money and we've got to take the gospel to the entire world how rome is still in charge the Sanhedrin hadn't even been knocked off. The, how would he leave at a moment like this? You see, when I look at that, I'm like, well, maybe there's hope for me. Maybe there's hope for me when all the questions that I've got. Doubt is not always a bad thing. In fact, I would suggest to you that doubt is often a divinely orchestrated thing to draw you deeper into God. Doubt is when the superficialities of your faith meet the harsh realities of the world. Charles Spurgeon would say doubt is like a foot poised. When you pick your foot up, a foot poised to go forwards or backwards. It is true, he said, doubt can drive you backwards into unbelief, but it is also true that you're never actually gonna go forward in faith until you learn to pick up that foot. So all throughout the Bible, we see God creating, if I can say it, moments of doubt so that he can invite his saints to not understand everything, that's what I'm gonna try to show you, but try to get them to behold more of the mystery of who he is. So to that end, I wanna unpack for a few minutes this morning, the experience of the man of the Bible who probably had more questions for God than anybody else, 
that I know of. In fact, his name has become synonymous with confusion and doubt, and his name, of course, is Job. We're going to be in chapter 38, so let me just give you a quick rundown of chapters 1 to 37. First thing I'll, I'll point out is we don't know much about Job at all. He's said to be from the land of Uz. Scholars ask, where is Uz? And not a single one of them knows. Uh, they assume you've got to follow the yellow brick road to get there, but that's about all they know. Furthermore, we do not know what time period Job lives in or even what nationality he is. We do know that he's not an Israelite because he doesn't have an Israelite name. But this lack of detail, scholars say, is intentional because evidently, they say, the author does not want us to get fixated on Job's particular historical situation. The author wants us instead to focus on the questions, the universal questions that are raised by Job's suffering. Questions that all of us at some point ask. All we're told in Job 1.1 is that Job is a blameless, upright man, which is just a Hebrew way of saying a really swell guy. It means that he helped little old ladies across the street, he ate all his vegetables, he turned in his library books on time, he read every single word of the terms and conditions on his iPhone update when it came through. He's just a stellar fella. But then right after this brief introduction, just two verses long, we get whisked off to heaven in verse 3 where God is apparently holding a staff meeting. And among God's staff is a particularly feisty fellow called the Satan. In Hebrew, it means literally the accuser or the prosecutor. And the Satan in the staff meeting raises a critical challenge. He says, God, you know, the only reason people on earth serve you is because it's in their own self-interest. They serve you because you give them stuff. You let them suffer and they will drop you like a bad habit. They'll give you up. And so God counters by saying, all right, well, let's take Job. You take everything in Job's life from him that Job loves, and you will see that Job values me for me. And for the next two chapters, that's exactly what happens. Satan begins systematically to take everything from Job. Interestingly, by the way, it's been pointed out, Satan doesn't touch Job's wife. I'm not sure what that even means. I mean, can't you hear another demon saying to Satan, like, hey, you forgot to mess with his wife. And he's like, nope. That's intentional. We're going to leave her right where she is. She turns out to be pretty cranky and not much of a help to him at all. Um, at this point in the narrative, though, as you're reading the book of Job, you're supposed to be asking yourself, you're supposed to be like, wait, what? Why in the world would God allow this? And then we would expect for the rest of the book to provide answers to this question, but quite frankly, that's not what we get. Chapter 3, enter Job's friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Zophar, the Naamathite, and, and the shortest man in the Bible, Bildad, the Shuhite. See what I did there? Okay. Um, that's why you go to seminary, to learn to make jokes like that one. Um, these men try to explain Job's, Job's suffering for the next 35 chapters using the best of ancient wisdom. For what it's worth, they actually seem to be halfway decent friends. They sit with Job in his misery, and they try to confront and comfort him. Basically, they say to Job, Job, look, we know. We know that God is just. Nobody's going to question that. We also know that everything, Job, happens for a reason. So Job, the fact that you're suffering means that there is a reason that God is doing this to you. But Job pushes back on them. He's like, well, that's just not true. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I understand that. Um, but I'm innocent of anything that would warrant this kind of suffering. But his friends hold the line. They're like, look, Job, there's got to be something. Again, Job, we know, right? We know the two premises of the syllogism are true. God is just and everything happens for a reason. So Job, you got to think hard. What is the reason? And this kind of back and forth banter goes on for 37 chapters. Finally, Job, exasperated, says, listen, guys, you're wrong. And the more you talk, the worse I feel. And you guys are not helping at all. It reminds me of the story of the man who gets pulled over by the police officer and his wife sitting next to him. And the policeman comes up and says, sir, do you have any idea how fast you were going? He says, no, officer. I think the you know, thing's broken. And his wife leaves up and says, yes, he did. He knows exactly how fast he was going. He commented on it right before you pulled him over. Officer said, well, do you know that your tail light is out? He says, oh, I had no idea. She looks up and says, yes, he did. He's been talking about that for months. He knows exactly that. Officer said, I noticed your seatbelt is off. Um, and he said, oh, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I just took it off right when, she, when you were walking up. And uh, she leans up and says, no, he didn't. He never wears his seatbelt when he drives. So this guy looks at his wife, you know, exasperated. He's like, woman, would you shut up? And the officer says, man, does he always talk to you this way? And, and he says, only when he's, she says, only when he's drunk. Um, that's when he talks to me this way. All right? Stop talking. You're not helping. That's what Job's friends are doing. And so we come to the end of chapter 37, and Job's friends, now exhausted of their wisdom, they begin to leave one by one, and Job sits there still confused. The point? The wisdom of the ancients has been spent, yet the mystery of suffering remains. And then finally, chapter 38, 
God shows up. And we, the reader, we think, at last, at last, I'm going to get some answers. I'm going to get some answers now that God has shown up. But no, instead, God shows up and starts to ask Job a bunch of his own questions, 64 to be exact, if you want to count. He says things like, chapter 38 and 39, Job, were you around when I shaved the earth? What were you doing, Job, when I put the constellations together? Hey, Job, while we're at it, where do storms come from? And can you tell me where the next one's coming from? And then mixed in these kind of big questions are some really, honestly, just odd, random ones, like chapter 39, verse 1, Job, how much do you know about the reproduction habits of goats? Or how about this one, um, chapter 38, 13, Job, why are ostriches so darn ugly? Can you tell me the answer to that, Job? And, and you're reading this and you're thinking, okay, I get the big questions, the stars questions and that kind of thing, but what, why, what, what, what the reproduction habits of goats, what's that got to do with anything? The point of all these questions is simply to show perspective. God is saying to Job, Job, if you can't even fathom all the mysteries behind natural things, are you really in a place to understand eternal things? You see, the assumption that Job and all of his friends have been working off of is that they actually know enough about the world to analyze and understand God's ways. And Job even thinks if God would just take a minute and explain this to me, then I might understand. But God says, actually, Job, your perspective on the world is quite puny. Mine is huge. You don't even understand simple things like constellation creation or ostrich ugliness. And if you don't understand the mystery behind finite things like this, do you really feel like you're in a place to hold court on me? You see, to understand infinite justice, you've got to have infinite perspective. And so chapter 40, God says, while we're at it, Job, would you really like to run the world for a day? Would you really like to punish every little act of injustice in every instance? Do you know, Job, how many different things are happening in the world at one time? How many different things are interconnected? Reminds me of that scene from Bruce Almighty where God lets that shining star of theological brilliance in our culture, Jim Carrey, you know, play, play God for a day. And all these prayers are coming in and, you know, basically he, he gives up because like, there's no way to keep up with everything that's happening. And how do you answer this prayer when this prayer contradicts with this prayer over here and you answer this and this changes over there at the end of chapter 40 god basically says this is quite a bit more complicated than you thought isn't it little man little joe then the book ends just put a period right there we're told that god ends up restoring everything to job sevenfold but we never really get satisfying answers to the question of why all this happened in the first place neither does job all we get are more questions but I'll tell you that these questions make five crucial points about the size of God. Here they are. Here's basically, if you were taking those 64 questions and boiling them down, these are the five things that I think are being taught there. Number one, God is saying to Job, Job, my power is sovereign. In this book, we see God's absolute power over creation, over angels, even over Satan. We see that Satan does nothing except by permission. And the book of Job shows us that God employs that power for purposes in creation that go far beyond our purview and sometimes for purposes that have nothing to do with us. For example, chapter 38, 26, God talks about watering a land where nobody lives. He reminded me of, and this may be where C.S. Lewis got it, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity talks about explorers coming across a new continent that man has never discovered before. And in this, on this continent, they see species of flowers that are so beautiful that nobody's ever discovered before. And Lewis's question was, all these flowers existed for however many thousands or tens of thousands of years before man ever saw them. All this beauty, nobody saw it. Why would God waste all that beauty if no man was ever going to see it? And Lewis's answer was, God does some things entirely for himself. God is the most important audience of everything that he does. The point is that not everything in creation is for man. Sometimes God does things solely for himself. You see, the one thing we do know about Job's suffering was that its ultimate purpose was to bring glory to God. God was using Job's suffering to demonstrate his glory to Satan and all the angels, and that was even more important than things in Job's life working out the way they were supposed to. And I know some of us hear that and we say, well, that's a hard thing to live with. It's a hard thing to live with that God might be putting me through suffering for his glory, but I am promising you that is the key to a secret, a secret to a happy and fulfilled life. When you come to really grasp that you and all the world exists for God's glory, when you realize that, you start to find a joy and satisfaction you've never known because you were created to live for something that was much bigger than yourself, not your purposes working out, but God's glory being known on the earth. 
Number two, God says to Job, my perspective is infinite. The climax climax of God's argument comes in chapter 42, three, when God says to Job, who is this that dares question my judgment without knowledge? Job, if you don't even understand the mystery behind natural phenomenon like storms and stars, Job, are you really in a place to understand the purposes of the eternal God behind those things? There's a problem I know that you've heard about. It's called the problem of evil. When I was a PhD student here, we learned it was first stated in its form we have it today by a philosopher named Epicurus, although I think you can see it here in Job, which predates Epicurus, 5th century BC. Basically, the idea is this. If God is all-loving, then he would want to stop suffering. If God is all-powerful, then he could stop suffering. The fact that suffering exists means that God must not either be all-loving or all-powerful. Therefore, God could not exist. It's a very strong syllogism, and for years it's been what especially atheists bring forward as kind of the proof that God really couldn't exist because suffering, if God's loving, he'd stop it. If he's powerful, he could stop it. It exists then. Well, what you see from Job is that that syllogism is missing a very crucial premise, and that premise is this. If God is all-loving and God is all-powerful, then it follows that God would be all-wise as well. And so the thing that you got to get your mind around, if you can, is that if God's wisdom is as high above my wisdom as God's power is high above my power, then wouldn't it make sense that there are a lot of things that God might be doing that I might not be able immediately to perceive? I think of it like this. If you'll do a thought experiment with me about just how much higher God's power is than yours. Think about how much power it would have taken, just go with me here, to create just the known universe, right? I mean, if there's a God, how much power did it take to create just the universe that we know about? Astronomers estimate the number of stars right now that we know about in the universe is 3,000 billion trillion. Mathematicians say septillion. 24 zeros after the three. Now, if you're like me, numbers like million, billion, and trillion, and septillion sound a lot like they're all the same. So let me just help you get your mind around. A million seconds ago, you know when a million seconds ago was? You remember what you were doing a million seconds ago? That was 11 days ago. Do you remember what you were doing 11 days ago? All right, how about a billion seconds ago? Do you remember what you were doing a billion seconds ago? All right, well, a, a million seconds ago was 11 days. A billion seconds ago was 31 years and eight months ago. Some of you, of course, can't remember what you were doing then because there was no you to speak of. It was sometime in the mid-1980s. The compact disc player had just been released. Rambo was saving our world from certain destruction. The Jedi were returning for the very first time. Right, that's a billion seconds. How about a trillion seconds ago? How long do you think a trillion seconds ago was? 300 years? A couple centuries back? A trillion seconds ago was 29,672 BC. And the first Rocky movie had just come out, I think, if if you want to date that that way, all right? Now, I want you to put, I want you to understand that there are 3,000 billion trillion stars, each of them, they say, putting out on average the same amount of energy every second as a trillion atom bombs, every second. Some of these stars are so big, they defy description, like Eta Carinae in our own Milky Way galaxy, which they say is five million times brighter than our sun. And these stars occupy an expanse we simply cannot comprehend. The Hubble telescope is now sending back faint infrared images of galaxies we didn't even know about. that are 12 billion light years away from us, and there are likely more beyond that, they say. All of this created, all of it, simply by God saying, let there be light. Now, I want you just to compare that to your power. I can't lift my mattress over my head. My wife and I tried it last week, and I had to wear a back brace for like five days after that. I mean, literally, I can't lift my mattress over my head. Um, we have a, a rowing machine downstairs in my house that uh, sometimes I'll use to, to work out. And I, there's different settings on there where you can track you know, what you're rowing. Uh, I, meters, I get that. Then there's um, uh, like calories burned, uh, that makes sense. There's a setting in there for watts. Why is the setting for watts on there? I think it's just there to humiliate me. Um, so I, I flipped it over there one day and I was like, how many watts can I do? So I mean, I'm talking, I mean, I'm like getting it done. 350 watts, which is by the way, what it takes to run that little refrigerator you got in your dorm room. That's 350 watts is what it takes to run that. I'm at 350 watts, I lasted for 40 seconds and then my wife woke me up three hours later, right? <laughs> 
So I'm like, okay, 350 watts, I can maintain about 40 seconds. I can keep a dorm room refrigerator powered for 40 seconds and God can create 3,000 billion trillion stars with just the word, let there be light. That's quite a gap of power. Now, I want you to suppose that what if God's wisdom is as high above yours as his power is above yours? Doesn't it make sense? Can't it be the only conclusion that there are some things that are gonna be beyond your immediate ability to understand? It is entirely possible that God has beautiful purposes that he's working out that we just can't see yet. Bart Ehrman, our neighborhood, friendly neighborhood atheist over at UNC Chapel Hill says, if you've read his books, which I have most of them, he says he lost his faith, not because of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. He said that was all window dressing. He said he lost his faith because of the presence of what he calls purposeless evil. But you know, there's a huge assumption behind the statement purposeless evil. And that is that if there really is a purpose, that Bart Ehrman would be wise enough to detect it. I would say it's rather arrogant to assume that with our limited knowledge, you and I would be able to perceive every purpose of an infinitely wise God. One of our core problems as a race is that we don't think of God as that much bigger than us. Like I said, we think of him as basically a slightly bigger, slightly smarter version of me. But y'all, does that make any sense when you think about how big God had to be to pull off creation? It's like we think of God as this, you know, huge earth universe creating muscles and this little itty bitty teeny tiny head. Job in response to God giving him this glimpse says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. In other words, my problem was not that I didn't understand, it's that I didn't realize how dumb and how limited I was. What I see now is how big you are. And I realized that my primary problem was I had the wrong posture in my questions. Your questions are great. Ask them. God invites you to ask them, but have some sense of the magnitude and the wisdom of the God to whom you're asking them. Number three, my purpose is guaranteed. My purpose is guaranteed. One of the most encouraging things in this book is we see that God's power is sovereign and his perspective is infinite. And thus even Satan's attempts to attack God's people only further God's purposes. Y'all think about it. All of Satan's best attacks on Job yielded a book that has provided encouragement to countless believers down through the centuries. Do you really feel like that's what Satan had planned when he started this process? This book is a big old gotcha right in Satan's face. Don't we see that all throughout scripture? Satan's strategy to defeat the sons of God only serves to provide greater salvation for the sons of men. Don't you see that in the book of Acts? seems like every attempt by Satan to stomp out the church just leads to its expansion. The best illustration of that is the cross. If there were ever a moment where it looked like Satan had won, it was at the cross. Yet it was at that very moment God was providing salvation for the human race. God took the worst day and he turned it into the best day. Believer, don't you understand that God is doing the same thing with your struggles? And what you are going through right now, God has a purpose. You may never quite understand it, but his purpose is bringing glory to himself and the nations. And that dark day you may face in seminary is because of something that God is intending to do in somebody around the world. And if you think about it, you can probably already see some of the good things that are behind what God is doing. I think of the words here of British journalist Malcolm Muggeridge. Contrary to what I would have expected, I look back now on experiences that at the time in my life seemed especially devastating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything of value that I've learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced or enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through comfort and ease. You can probably already see that, can't you? You can look back in your life and see how in some chapter that God was actually doing something good. The perspective of Job is this, if already you can look back and see a good purpose for some of the suffering in your life, don't you think that given infinite time and perspective, you'll see a reason for all of it? You see, a lot of times what God is doing, he's doing in you. You got to get your mind around three different kinds of suffering that take place, all of which we see occur in the Old Testament with guys, I call them the three Joes of the Old Testament. Sometimes suffering is there to chastise us and bring us back. That's Jonah. Right, sometimes the suffering is happening in our lives so we can work salvation in other people. That's Joseph. Sometimes suffering is happening just so God can make us love him more and stand more in all of him. And that's what we see in Job. Suffering is how God shapes you for himself and for the ministry he has called you to. 
Martin Luther, one of my favorite authors, said, as soon as God chooses you, you better be ready because he's going to let the devil afflict you to turn you into a real doctor of the word. Luther said, it's one of my favorite statements by him, I credit the devil, the pope, and all my other persecutors with my deep knowledge of the word. Through the devil's raging, they've actually turned me into a fairly good preacher, driving me into the depths, gospel to depths I never would have reached without their afflictions. See, that's what the gospel is all about. Satan's strategy to defeat the sons of God only serves to provide salvation for the sons of men. Believer, I can promise you that's what he's doing in your suffering. Number four, he says, my promise is everlasting. My favorite verse in this book, hands down, is chapter 19, verse 25. You know it. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand in, on the earth. A few things about that verse. In the end, that means in eternity. The last scene in the book of Job is God restoring to Job sevenfold of all that he had lost. Seven, of course, in Hebrew is a picture of eternity. So in this scene, we're given a glimpse of what eternity is going to be like when God restores to us all that we've lost and overflow us with perfect joy. Psalm 1611, in your presence is the fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Fullness of joy means joy that could not get any stronger. Last forevermore means it could not last any longer. Let me think for a minute, how long is eternity? Whatever it is, the whole life you've lived up to this point is going to seem like just the first few seconds of a never-ending glorious day. Your whole life will be like a brief ellipsis compared to the expanse of eternity. And that means there's literally nothing, not even things like the Holocaust that we go through on earth that really make that significant of a dent on eternity. Mother Teresa said that compared to eternity, the worst things on earth are like nothing more than one bad night in a cheap hotel. You ever stayed in a cheap hotel? My family has. We've tried to cut corners, and I would never advise that. I've stayed, some over, I've stayed one overseas where we took the cheaper option, and in the middle of the night, a scorpion like walks across the, you know, the floor, and I thought, we should have paid the extra three and a half dollars to stay in the nicer hotel. One bad night in a cheap hotel. It's, it's painful when you go through it, but now you just look back and you laugh about it. You see, recognizing that is the key to coping with suffering in this life. C.S. Lewis said, if you look at this world as a place to find happiness, you will always be miserable and confused. Always. But if you look at this world as training ground for the next, then you'll find purpose and joy. So leads me to the last one, number five, my presence is pledged. My presence is pledged. My power is sovereign. My perspective is infinite. My purpose is guaranteed. My promise is everlasting. And yes, my presence is pledged. And yes, they're all going to start with Pete. When you get nominated for SBC president, it's in the bylaws. It's just, you got to start doing that. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that in the end, he will stand on the earth. You see, I have to wonder what Job was thinking about when he wrote that, because, you see, I know that you and I know even more than Job did. Because we have actually seen what Job hasn't seen, and that is we saw our Redeemer come and stand on the earth with us. And we know why he was there. We know that he came to take our punishment and our place so that we would never have to be separated from him again. So yes, I am wounded sometimes, but he was wounded for me so that I could be eternally healed. Yes, there are times that I feel abandoned, but he was abandoned for me so that I could be eternally embraced. That means that his mercy is ever present with me and I never have to worry about what he is doing in my life. He stands by my side, I know that, because he stood in my place. I love the words of A.W. Tozer here. With the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it. What is it that you lack? And what is it that you're afraid of? You see, I may not know exactly what God is doing in my pain, but the cross shows me what my suffering does not mean. I don't know necessarily what he's doing, but I know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God has lost control, and it doesn't mean that God is out of love for me. Because if there were ever a moment in history where it looked like God was out of control, it was the cross. And that was the very moment God was doing his greatest work of salvation. It was at the cross I saw the extent to which God would go to save me. And I know that if he didn't turn my, his back on me when I was his enemy, I know he hadn't turned his back on me now that I am his son. You see, that's what he's doing right now through your pain. It may feel to you like a dark night of the soul, but God is working in it the power of resurrection just like he did through Jesus because your Redeemer came and stood in your place. He entered into your pain for you. He took death for you, and now he stands victoriously by your side in the resurrection. 
promising you that one day you will stand with him eternally. So in your pain, you've got that presence. So that's what God showed Job. Understand this. Job wanted explanation for why he suffered. He never got it. What God gave him instead was a revelation of who he was. And it's when Job saw that that he was satisfied. Even before things got restored to him. In fact, when God finally appeared, Job was so busy repenting, he didn't have time for any further questions. All of his rage and his confusion was directed at himself, which is a picture of what you and I will be like in eternity. I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. When you see the beauty and the magnitude and the size of Christ, you stop asking the why and you start trusting the who. Listen, your questions are okay. I said, there's nothing wrong with them. Keep asking them. Doubt can be divinely inspired. It's a foot poise to go forwards or backwards, but God's answer is not usually to give you an explanation of his ways, but a revelation of who he is. You see, all of us are a lot like Job. We think we need an explanation of God's ways, but what you really need is something you can't learn from a textbook, something Wayne Grudem can't teach you. You need something the Spirit of God can teach you, and that is for him to open your eyes on how big God is. You need a God who is big enough, who is God enough to work all these promises out for good and faithful and loving enough that what he promises will come true just like he has said. And when you see that, you're gonna join countless suffering believers down through history who have said that is enough, who like Corey Timboom, who after suffering for years in a Nazi prison camp said, no matter how deep the darkness, what I found was that God's love was deeper still. Let me close and I'll pray here, but I heard a talk a few weeks ago by Steve Saint, you probably know who he is. His father was murdered on the beaches of Ecuador several years ago. There was a particularly hostile tribe there called the Alka Indians, untouched by civilization. Five men, now known as the Alka Five, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Roger Goddard, and two other guys tried to establish contact with them and they were all murdered. Well, later, Steve was a part of the group that went back to that same people group and ended up making friends with them. In fact, in one of the greatest stories of grace I've ever heard, he led to Christ, the very man who had murdered his father. He baptized him. And then they adopted this man into his family as his kid's surrogate grandfather to replace the man that this guy had murdered, his dad. He said this at the end of the talk, though, which is why I share it. He said, why is it that we need every chapter to be good when God promises only that in the last chapter, he'll make all the other chapters make sense? That's the message of Job. You might be in a chapter with Job, but believer, I can tell you, I can tell you that your Redeemer lives. See his power, his love, his control, and know that he lives, and that'll be enough. That'll be enough. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, high King of heaven, my treasure thou art. Let me pray for you. Got to pray first. Just in going through this, I've realized again how dull my heart is. God, how my head is full of knowledge, but my heart is woefully behind of worship. God, open our eyes to see how big and how wide and how deep are the love, is the love that you give for us and the promises that you extend to us. God, give us things that seminary can't teach us, things that only the Spirit of God can teach us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.